Hey, welcome to Pod of Mercy. I am your host, Long Hair Linda, and today's special guest co-host is... Liam Bagnall. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm always awkward at intros. I don't even know how That's to fine. introduce myself. Do you know my first ever episode? Mm. I had Flawless on. Yeah. And I fumbled the intro. Yeah. And something happened to my voice, and I was like, you know what? I'm not even editing out. That will stay in. Keep it raw. Just keep, keep it, it raw. Yeah, and then people can just hear that intros are not fun. There's many times that I've been intro to podcasts or things, and every time I, 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 I'm thinking in my head, oh, I'm going to say this, I'm going to say this, and then when it comes, like, oh, Liam, hi, hi, <laughs> hi, 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 I just. <laughs> awkward I think it's probably worse when you try and think of an intro because it'll never be how good it was in your head yeah because you haven't written it down you've not practiced it it's just something you thought would be cute yeah and then you, and you, it just doesn't work that's how you fumble that's how you fumble so Liam mm. uh, before we get into the episode I like to do a quick rapid fire round just okay. to get a little bit of a warm-up going at the start okay. right I'm nervous so there are 10 questions that you have to answer okay. and you have 45 seconds to do it what, to answer all of them? Yes. So I'm going to ask you and then you answer. Ask, answer. And we've got to do it in 45 seconds. Do you think it's doable? That's four and a half seconds per, per question. Yeah, question. Sure, sure. Do you like, think it's, it's doable? It's like a Rorschach test. I could do this. I could do this. <laughs> well, so far, I've only beat one guest. Everyone else has, has managed it. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know if that adds pressure or if that makes you feel better. And but... how do you win if I don't get to the end? Yeah, if I if you don't answer all of the questions in time, I'm then sweating. technically I win. I mean, it was supposed to be a team thing, but I kind of like <laughs> I like it being a competitive thing. Okay. So are you ready? I am ready. Okay. You just answer, have to answer truthfully and whatever comes to your mind. Okay? Yeah. Ready? Yeah. And go. First thing you do when you wake up. Uh, check my phone. Name three things that make you happy. Um, music, film, uh, seeing other people's success. Favourite camera to use? Uh, Canon C300 Mark II at the moment. If you could be an animal for a day, which animal would you be? Sloth all day. <laughs> Biggest pet peeve? Um, micro scooters, adults on micro scooters. What's the most you've spent on one pair of trainers? Uh, £169. Breakfast or dinner? Uh, dinner, don't eat breakfast. Favourite movie? Uh, Fight Club. Dream dinner guest, dead or alive? Uh, Quentin Tarantino. Best gift you've ever received? Um... Oh, that's mad. That's someone sent me a Polaroid camera. I loved it. You did it. I did it. With three seconds to spare. <sighs> well done. <laughs> as soon as I can say stuff like sloth, but I was, you, if you think with the can, camera one, I'd be... But I know sloth. It, like puts, you, it puts you on the spot, though. It did. And so I felt, I felt really point. bad. It was it was realising the first thing I do when I wake up is check my phone is, it's shit, isn't it? <laughs> it's a bad thing. I do the exact same thing. It's bad Sometimes thing. I like, you know, if you get up to go to the loo in the middle of the night, mm. I'll still check my phone then. I'm mm. supposed to just go back to sleep. Mm. But I'll have a quick... See, if I'm doing that, I need to try and keep my eyes closed because I'm worried if I, if I open my eyes. So I just I fumble around to try and find the <laughs> toilet because I'm too nervous that if I open my eyes, then I won't be able to go back to sleep. Yeah. I'm weird. No, I do the same thing, except I just open my eyes and look on social media. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, this is going out in the new year. Okay. So we are in the future. We are in 2020. Happy 2020. Happy to a happy new year. How great was New Year's? I mean, it was the best. Did could you believe what happened on New Year's Eve? I don't think we can talk about. I don't. I don't think we should. Too much. It's too much. So a popular New Year's resolution is travel more. People always say, "I'm this year. It's definitely going to be my year. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm going to travel more and Mm. see more of the world." So, um, I thought, who better than Mr. Liam Bagnall to discuss? Um, the importance of traveling, seeing mm. the world, experiencing different cultures, etc., mm. etc. So, what's the favourite city that you've been to, and why? It's, uh, it's a bit. It's a bit of a tough question. Like I, I love traveling so much. I mean, I try to. My new thing or my resolution that I made to myself a few uh, New Years back was to wake up in a different country every New Years. So nice. I don't want to do it in England. Don't want to do it in London. Um, and I've been quite fortunate with my travels that I've gone to a lot of different places. Um, my favourite of them, oh, it's quite difficult. Like, I really love New Orleans. It felt like my music spiritual home. I just felt very, very happy there. Um, but, oh, is it my favourite place? Oh, Vietnam was good. Trinidad was good. Um, I'm, I'm going to say New Orleans. There's just something about it. I don't know if it's, it's it's one of the only places in America that you can go where there feels like there's some sort of history. Mm-hmm. I know it's not the most positive history, um, but 
you know, everywhere in America, it, it looks 100 years old, but it's got all this old French uh, Gothic and the influence from uh, Creole is so uh, vibrant and interesting. The food's amazing and it's just, it's like Dublin for jazz. And yeah. what the most inspiring thing is when you go there is there's loads of kids who aren't over 21, so they're not allowed to go and play in jazz clubs. So they form their own little like street gang uh, brass band and they're just the illest musicians. And you see all these, these like 10 year olds in the group, there's 18 year olds in the group and everywhere you go there's just this beautiful brass music. And it's not like jazz like you think. It's like, you know, you go into a club and it's popping and they're just playing a saxophone. Mm. It's just such a vibe in the food. Ooh la la. Amazing. Ooh la la. Oh, I'm jealous. Orleans. I'd love to go to New Orleans. Everything I've ever seen about it just seems like I would just enjoy it. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah. Like, a lot of people talk about going to um, what, whatever the main road is. I forgot what the main road is. I know the one you mean. Where all the parades are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's bad that I can't remember it. But, like, I, going down there, it's like going to Magaluf. It's so trashy and shit. But mm. around the corner is, like, the local version um, called Frenchman Street. And it's just such a better vibe. And it's where all the locals go. I've been quite fortunate when I've been to these places that actually from career and rap and battle rap, you get to meet a lot of the locals and mm. you get to hang out with them and find out the places. And I went there, I've been there three times. One time I went to do a documentary for Free Mobile and the whole point of the documentary was how basically with Free Mobile you can use your phone abroad for free so you could find all like the stuff that you should be able to find. So we ended up um, going to all the best places. We broke into like this estate that was just completely painted by street artists we found all these weird places that you just wouldn't go if yeah. you didn't know and I literally just had the best time we tried to break into the abandoned Six Flags as well <laughs> they've got like where um, Katrina came in yeah. they've got this whole uh, theme park that's just completely abandoned right. like it's filled with snakes and there's plants growing out of the ro- uh, roller coasters and stuff and you wanted to break into there? imagine the photos I like as a if you made it back out yeah <laughs> we, we, we got kicked out by the security guard we got close I went with my photographer mate Ron Timmerin who's like fucking amazing talent a like, photographer for Adidas really really good and um, we like he wanted to do a bando so we started running in to get in hiding behind things and we got collared and then we tried to go around the other way and the guy got really really annoyed so we couldn't get in <laughs> but we tried see it's funny that you say about like actually getting to experience the city outside of all the typical touristy shit because yeah. even though it's super biased my favorite city is Nairobi for that reason mm. because I have family there mm. I know places to go that aren't just too typical where they'll take every tourist mm. and so I find that I just really enjoy it because of like authenticity and just yeah. you, you get a real local feel and I think that's why that's probably why I'm, that's my favorite but, city that, that's it's important to actually I don't know. See the place. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to see, like, I don't want to see the same old touristy shit no. that you can get a postcard and be like, yeah. I was here, you know, and I don't. I don't. You know, I think a lot of people just, you know, when people talk about going to sit by a beach or sit by a pool and read a book, it's just, for me, going to somewhere, I feel so blessed and lucky to be able to go and experience some other, someone else's culture. Yeah. So if I go there, I'm in there like 100% just so that I could, you know, see how it see how it feels, taste how it feels, look how it feels. I know it sounds a bit um, weird, but I always try to m- make friends or actually, when, I, when I've been single, dating apps have been really good when you've been abroad because it's been a way where you can go and meet a local person and they take you to all of the local places. I think it's really important to actually like experience um, culture if you're going away. It's not just about sitting on the bloody arse. Yeah. No, if you're lucky enough to go somewhere mad, you might as well go and see. You might as well see everything. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Now you talked about the food in New Orleans. Yes. So am I right in assuming that you think that that's where you've had the best food, or would you give that to? It doesn't have to be a city; it can be a country overall um, where you had the best food. I don't think it is, but I had a. Te- I've got a funny story about eating in New Orleans where okay. I was trying like a couple of years ago. I wanted to try a challenge every month to see if I could like uh, change the way I disciplined myself. Mm-hmm. So I tried like, you know, no no sugars, no, uh, well, vegan, I had to cook something different every day, try to learn a bit of a new language every single day, um, just try doing all these weird challenges. And I was doing veganism and I had it for a month. And this was early veganism, this was like four years ago when options were a lot more limited. I know, yeah, <laughs> it was fun. That was a fun time of being vegan. 
<laughs> so like, I, I go to, I suddenly get a job offer to go to New Orleans. Mm-hmm. So I go to New Orleans, and being vegan in New Orleans is pretty much. It's Isn't a, it like seafood, crab rolls everywhere? No, like even the vegetables, they refuse to cut, cook without butter because right. they've got like the holy trinity out there, which is like butter, garlic, and chili, and it's yeah. like everything. And I was like, could you just not? Not. And they're like, no, sorry, you can't. No olive oil anywhere. Like, like they literally <laughs> wouldn't do anything. So I spent the first five days, and I was with Charlie Hyams, who's also uh, vegan. And we're trying to, like, he was fine just eating sticks and bananas, like seeds and nuts and bananas. But I was, it was really getting to me. And it, like, the final day of the shoot was just going to all these amazing restaurants. And we went to the, it was like the meatiest place. And the chef came out and he was like, oh, can you not eat? And he's like, sorry, we're vegan, we can't. And uh, he was like, oh, that sounds like a challenge. Do you like stuff that's a bit oriental? Do you like this? Do you like that? And he went in the back and he made like a Michelin star vegan dish for wow. Charlie to eat. Uh, and then on the last day, I remember we went into this um, like sandwich shop, and the woman came, came over and was like, oh, "Can I get you some food?" And we're like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." Could um, we, we, at the moment we're not eating any animal products. Uh, <laughs> spend what you can do with that. And she was like, "Oh, so you want like eggs?" And we're like, um, no, "We can't have anything that comes from an animal." Butter? No, I mean, cheese? Literally nothing that comes Fish? from an animal. Fish. Uh, and she's like, "Oh." Well, y'all gonna have to eat water. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, the food there is amazing. But actually, in Trinidad, uh, I had this. Trinidad's like the most bizarre place mm-hmm. because it's like um, it's massively Caribbean, but it, there's such a large uh, portion of like Indian people who live there. But they all sound Caribbean. And when we first went there, it was the first time we experienced it. But the, the, their food culture, because of that, is this cool mix between Car- uh, Caribbean and uh, Indian. And they made this thing called doubles, which is like two rotis. And then there's this chickpea curry. I don't know what it was. But uh, the guy was like professional, flipping it, doing all this stuff. And it was literally the best thing I've ever tasted in my life. And there's no way that I can ever have it again that sounds so my mouth watered a little bit I'm not going to lie that sounds amazing it is so good it is so good <laughs> it's so good it, yeah and most of the food there was uh, vegan as well that's handy the Trinidad was a bit scary it was good I like that well see I the one time I'm actually glad I wasn't vegan uh, was when I was in Greece so I studied it in, in Athens for a year um, as part of my my degree and thankfully I wasn't vegan yet so I could actually enjoy the food because mm. I think I would have really struggled in Greece. You'd think because it's all like, especially when it's warm weather, it's all mm. salads and stuff. It's like, no, it's... Still feta everywhere. Feta absolutely everywhere. And it's, you know, again, they love butter over there. Yeah, um, yeah. And so, I mean, I'm so glad I wasn't vegan. That's probably where I'd say I had the best food was Greece. Yeah, Greece is good. I've only, I haven't done enough oh, of Greece. My God, it's just so... Like, everywhere we went, mm. every restaurant, every takeaway place, every little tiny little gyro spot, mm. like, everything was just so good constantly. Is your favourite food Greek, then? Um, see, I hesitate to say that now because I've been vegan now for four and a half years, I want yeah. to say. It'd just be chips and salad at this point. Exactly. So right now, no. Right now, mm. it's a it's it's somewhere in between Mexican and Japanese. Yeah. Um, if I was to pick a favorite now, but for a long time it was it was Greek because mm. because of that experience. Mm. And weirdly enough, as well, I've been to France loads of times and I've had pastries in France and I know that they're amazing and all the rest of it, right? But the best pan au chocolat I've ever had in my life was in Athens, in Greece. Really? Yeah so surprising okay and they were just really good at it I don't yeah. know why but probably because they're really good at pastries yeah, like their spanakopita and all of that much flakier it well, didn't get everywhere though but it was very like that pastry was incredible and no, then my mouth I know <laughs> So it's mine. <laughs> let's, move, let's move away from this. I, I want to know how many people when listening to this podcast have gone to eat at this point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, probably. They probably paused. They just said, no, I have to go get food now. Yeah. Um, okay, so because I mentioned my year abroad, that's the longest I've spent in a country abroad, which mm. was an academic year, so not a full year. Mm. What's the longest amount of time you spent in, in an a international single country. country? Yeah, in, in one place. Country. Um, surprisingly, I didn't actually, I never took a gap year or never did anything like that. I've just been quite fortunate with work. And while I have thought in my head often, I would love to go and live in a different country. I think with how the trajectory of all my film stuff was going, I was worried that if I ever stepped away from it, then I'd, I'd lose it. You get very OCD and protective over mm-hmm. yeah, films. They might way. lose steam or something. Well, yeah, it felt like, I don't know, coming up in the freelance way, it was very much like, you know, 
I, I said yes to everything because if you said no to something, someone else would say yes, and then potentially you'd never get asked again. So I just got so used to just being like, you know, we get offered a job to go to New York tomorrow, but it was my girlfriend's birthday. I'd be like, I'm sorry, I've got to go mm. because it was just so like it gets, and you get a bit of a, you get quite protective and worried that um, if you if you stop or if you don't if you do anything like that, then you just potentially will lose your trajectory. And right. I was chasing that. So um, longest of actually being in the country was. I did a job in Belize last year. Nice. Where I was living basically in the jungle for a month, and it was fucked up. Like it was cool. It was mm. re- like it was a really interesting experience. And one of the things that I like about what I do is I've done stuff that you just would never do. You would never do it unless it was for work. And in Belize, so I think we only slept in the jungle four nights. The rest of the team weren't really feeling it. Yeah. There's a lot of people sleeping in cars. Um, we were shooting like this documentary about uh, the army and I wrote this comedy thing that I did with my writer where we got them to do some Bear grill stuff. But sleeping in the jungle, you have to wait until it gets pitch black and then you have to set up a hammock. You have to find two trees that are roughly like nine foot apart. You got taught this knot once and you put this hammock up, you have to test it and you have to put a rain sheet over the top because it pisses it down. But when you put your head torch on, you, you, mosquitoes just start attacking your face. Oh my god! And then when you look around, all you can see is the eyes of things looking at you. And there was, you know, howler monkeys, scorpions, snakes, gators, uh, every spider you can imagine. A thing called the bastard tree, which is just a tree with these fuck off needles on it that you'd walk into and go, oh, you bastard!" Um, <laughs> and it just everything wanted to kill you. Uh, there was the most poisonous snake in the world. Was there? I don't know, I'm scared of snakes. Um, and just like sleeping in it, uh, but. I, I how was, did how did you sleep? Did you actually get any sleep? I put, I put headphones on and I was just like, oh, okay, cool. Uh, one night, I think it was, I don't always snore, uh, but uh, the way I was lying was like that. And the, me and Julia had been put aside, and suddenly, like, it gets to like four in the morning. And I just say, bags, bags, bags. And like the army run over, and everyone there. And Julia's like, there's a fucking Jaguar, there's a fucking Jaguar outside. Oh, oh my tent. God. And we're all freaking out, and we were like talking for a bit, and we're like, look, the Jaguar. I think it seems it seems to have, have gone and then I fell back to sleep and apparently I started snoring and they found out that the Jaguar was actually the vacua <laughs> <laughs> so it's you it's you terrifying everybody when yeah. you're snoring fab so, 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 I, am, I am the vacua uh, yeah, yeah so that was might cool. actually call you that from now on <laughs> uh, but yeah so I spent a month there uh, and then I guess I did do a job which kept me out of the country for three months but it was going through different part, different places so I started in Barcelona and then went to Athens and then went to Barbados and then went to Trinidad and then back to Barbados and then home but it was like a long stint but that was a bit much that sounds incredible though it, it was good I mean the thing is with the film stuff I think on the outside because you know you only take pictures of the things that look good I think everyone's yeah. like oh it's so easy I bet it's so fun but the amount of time you spend with your head in your hand in the showers just doing like 27 hour days and it's like very intense mm. you know so like even though I did all of those stuff and we went to some really cool places it's very much like you know go 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 uh, a lot of stress you've got like clients and you've got loads of like worries that people spend like hundreds of grand on what you're doing and if it's not right if you miss a single thing you fucked so yeah is it one of those where you, you get the fondness when you look back at it rather than when you're going oh, yeah. through it? Yeah. yeah. And then the main thing is the camaraderie. Mm. The, the, re- the real beautiful thing about uh, what I do in doing those things away is how how much everyone pulls together. Yeah. Because it is really fucked up and it is really intense. It is really, really difficult. And you kind of rely on the team to just like gel and help. Like my best friend, Jessamy, you know, when we were in Austin doing a documentary of Bam on barbecue food, like after every shoot we'd have like 20 hour days and I'd just be in the bar just reading her what my narrative was and because it would change every day because different things would happen and mm. you'd have to keep adapting i just keep talking at her and she's like yeah yeah and it, it becomes this like mental jigsaw puzzle but how close everyone gets on those trips and how much like you know you know big production tv crews would be like a hundred or a thousand people working on it we'll do it in a team of four so yeah. it's just a bit like so even though I've been to a lot of places I'd, I'd go to them again without working to see them to yeah. actually see them yeah. yeah 
I'd say that's good though that you have the the camaraderie side of it though so there was always that positive even mm. if you weren't able to see everything you wanted to see the first time around yeah. you go there yeah. at least you built incredible relationships and it's like I've worked with a lot of like younger kids there are a lot of people who like wouldn't have got into film otherwise and just seeing how sick they are makes me so gassed like I love seeing I love seeing people come up I love seeing like there's nothing greater to me than just seeing someone being creative or someone um do well there's a lot of people out there I think that really like get their hate seeing other people do well but for me my success is their success mm. their success is my success even not the other way around that sounds rude <laughs> <laughs> anyway I went off topic you know what no like. no no it's fine it's, it's what it's about um, alright so then which city or country would you say had the best culture in your opinion oh oh and for what reason that is a really good question. Um, I'm really looking forward to doing it. Well, I would have been in Asia when this comes out. Um, so Asia was, was amazing. amazing. Asia was amazing. <laughs> like I loved Vietnam, but doing it on my own, I wish I did it with other people, and I think I would have enjoyed it more. There's a lot of like weird anxiety that I, was, I felt like because I was 31 and stuff that I might not make friends, and I didn't know what the trip would be like, but I right. had a really good time. But the culture there was great. But um, weirdly, I hated it for a lot of reasons which are kind of, I guess, privilege reasons in a way. But like going to Manila when we shot the documentary and we were there for two weeks, it was so, like, I think, I think it was my first trip to the third world. And like when you, when you get there, it's like a jungle city. It's like a city which meets jungle and it's like highest amount of uh, homeless children. It's like... I think 70% unemployed. It's like the same space as America, as, in, as London, but triple the population. And then 70% of that is homeless, homeless or unemployed. And it is savage. Like, it, you know, you, as soon as you get there, there's just naked children everywhere. There's like, it's, it, was re- it was really deep. But like, being embedded there, you know, the, the reason I, I, there was reasons that I felt upset being there and it was because I was sad for the kids and it wasn't really anything that we could do, even though, you know, try and, give them food, whatever production budget we had left at the end, you give them that. But, you know, just because it was a shock to me, I was mm. just like, fuck, this is savage. But actually being there, you know, we did very unorthodox, like Manila. When we were there, we were in Tondo in the ghetto. We went and, like, saw all these kids in these shanty towns. And, like, as soon as I got there, like, hundreds of kids just, like, swarmed me. We were holding my hands. We were walking through all these, like, ghettos together. We went to uh, the Manila Cemetery, which is, like, population alive in the cemetery is like two million and like they on the graves were all stacked and then they built slums on top of the graves oh and God. all the people there were just so sick they built like shops um like the culture of death was really fucking interesting uh food culture was really interesting going into all of these different diverse locations finding out about hip-hop culture there was really mm. interesting uh, we wanted to spend a night actually living how uh, there's a rapper from the philippines called enigma how people live there so we went to, me and mark Grist went to stay with him and he cooked us like pork adobo which was like my favourite food we did this game where you go up to the top and you have to ask a question you have to drink a bit of beer then you pass the beer and you, you get the whole group shares the beer and it just I felt like culturally embedded in there uh, so much by the end um, and what freaked me out uh, at the at the start was what really made me like love it in a way mm-hmm. I don't recommend it for everyone like a lot of yeah. people when they go to Philippines, we'll go to the beaches, we'll go to all of the mad islands. I didn't see that side. Mm. We went to the jungle for one day and we stayed in this place called uh, the Nature Villa, which sounds lovely. It sounds like a oh, resort. It's a tree, right? And it's just, there's no windows, <laughs> right? Okay. So there's just all manners of spiders, oh rats, my God. And bats. No. In there. Mark went to his room, a fucking bat flew out. Everyone's Jesus. screaming. We're all like shrieking. We've got our. Uh, one of our fixers, this uh, amazing girl, Inky, she was just laughing at all of us because we all found it so scary, but she was just like, this is normal, you know. It's, <laughs> it's a bat. <laughs> yeah, it's a bat. Uh, but the whole production team was so scared of this place that we had to, we got really pissed. And Mark Grist loves the board games and he brought all these board games. We played this bean farmer game, which sounds stupid. You're a bean farmer, you have to collect beans. It's really weird. But we all got so into it by the end. So wait, you ha- wait, wait, wait. You have, to, you have to break it down. How does this bean farmer game go? It's kind of like... Like exploding kittens or whatever that unicorn one is, where you collect like power cards, but like you're a bean farmer, and you need to get a certain amount of beans in your uh, 
like in fun. your arsenal type thing yeah, yeah. So, but beans are cards and they're all their powers and you can fuck over other people and it becomes really oh, nice like, okay. you can sit like, like you have your cards and like someone will suddenly just be like oh so uh, have you got a uh, have you got the, have you got the jumping bean? And you did, like everyone start trying to fuck each other off, but the the language you talk into, and to begin with, we're all like this is weird. But by the end of it, we're all just like you're like really into it. Have you got that? Uh, have you got that kidney bean? bean? <laughs> and then, like we've got so into it. But Mark 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 loves board games. He's really fucking loves it. Uh, and then the next day, so we found out that um, basically they believe that there's this guy. I think it's Jose Rizel or something like that. That they believe he's like like another coming of Jesus they think he's related to Hitler these they, all these really weird myths are about this guy okay but he's like the most famous poet in uh, the Philippines he's dead um, and in the jungle he, there's this pilgrimage that he does where he walks he goes into this freezing pool he goes into this freezing um, like waterfall and he has to do his pilgrimage through the jungle so we went and did that pilgrimage and it was just as I, as I mean just like culturally like what I learned yeah it's just fucking amazing I mean even carrying a 30 kilogram camera on my shoulder the whole time and shooting in there was mad at one point Mark was like Liam you're steaming and I was just, just <laughs> steam coming off of it. but yeah no that was a very long answer I feel like I've got stories for everything no that's that's exactly why you're yeah. here Liam <laughs> I've got you um god that does sound amazing it's though because you're you you're like immersed in it you can't it's not like you just popped in and out and no. had a, you know, or, or viewed it from like a, what's the, what's the phrase? Like, so like a fly in the wall fire, type. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't, you were actually immersed in it and a part of it for that period of time, which yeah. is you know, amazing. I, I get these real weird feelings in my life. I've had it like several times. I had it in Washington with Fred, I had it in Miami with Fred. I, in certain places in the world that I go to, I get like overcome with euphoria where I just feel so happy. I just, you know, I just stare at where I'm staring at. I just smile so much. And it was just one of those feelings when you when you're so like culturally inundated by something, mm. it just like overwhelms me, and I feel so like you no know, like I'm not religious, but I, I'd use the word blessed. I just feel so lucky to have been able to experience something like that. And with uh, the trip to the Philippines, it was very much like fuck, it's amazing. Yeah. This is so cool. And you know, I don't want to experience my life by watching it on the TV. I want to proper experience stuff. Be in it. Mm. Yeah. That, that is the importance of traveling. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to have an answer anywhere near as good as that. Mm. Um, and again, it's going to be super biased. My, my I think my, the country I've been to, and I haven't been to as many as I'd like, um, that has the best culture for me is going to be Kenya. Kenya. Um, because, yes, I'm from there. My family's from mm. there. But in terms of... And I think a lot of African countries have this in common and probably Asian countries as well. But I know it's very, very common in Africa where you have so many tribes Mm. that kind of come together to form a country. Mm. Um, Not always by choice, but that's how Mm. (laughs) that works. But uh, yeah, so like Kenya, for example, there are so many different tribes, so many different customs Mm. and and stereotypes that everyone has for each other. And it's all, you know, for the most part, I think it's in good fun. But just being in it and experiencing something that's like my where my family comes from and how the you know how they have like mixed with other Mm. tribes and like you'll have certain conversations and be talking about how you feel about something or a personality trait and they'll be like oh you know it's xyz tribe that's you know that's from your granddad or Mm. that's from whoever and i just love that like do you find something new every time you go back yeah yeah i find something new there's always some kind of story there's always something that i hadn't heard Mm. Um, which I just I love I, what's your favourite thing about Kenya or Nairobi or where oh, my favourite thing is that no matter how long it's been since I've been there I, I go back and within an hour I'm like I just feel right at home yeah even if I don't recognise something you know if I go to an area where I haven't necessarily been before or I go to an area that I have been before but something's different the buildings have changed the shops have changed whatever Mm. I go there and I'm just I just instantly I just feel relaxed Mm. I don't have to worry about anything because for the most part whenever I travel I'm I'm a little bit OCD so I'm Mm. like oh I'm trying to make sure I have everything organised bit of a control freak I don't feel that way in Nairobi at all that's sick and so I think that's probably why that will always be the same answer for me. Now, I haven't experienced, you know, as much of the world as I'd like to, certainly mm. not as much as you. Mm. Um, so that answer could change. But for now, it is still Kenya. Mm. For sure. That's beautiful. I really, I need to do more of Africa. I've only, I haven't done much at all. Yeah. I've only been to Gabon and I've done Morocco. I didn't like Morocco. 
But, uh, a lot of people tell me they don't like Morocco. I, like it's it's again um, like it, it, it was a cultural difference that I didn't like. But just when I went with my ex, mm. like they just wouldn't talk to her and they were really rude to her everywhere that we went. I was like, I don't know. I know to a certain extent, you you know, cultural values, you can't judge certain cultures by your own culture. Yeah, like, you know, like your own standard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I found that out in um, Philippines where, um, you know, they you know they paint chicks and stuff. They're so poor, they paint the chicks, the chicks die. I remember post picture around it and everyone was like, oh, these people are bar- barbaric, they're horrible, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I was speaking to Enigma and it was a lot about, like, um, the Duarte guy, the, the, pre- the president, mm. uh, who'd said, you know... You, you, drug, killing drug dealers is fine you know like we're not going to do anything about it just yeah. kill them and I remember I was like yeah don't you think that's awful it's so bad blah blah blah, blah. and he was like you can't you can't solve third world problems with first world ideals mm. like what like you the problem is other people will try and talk about it and the way the news reporting it is a lot worse than it is since that's happened good people don't die and he's telling me stories of all this fucked up shit that happened he was like you know you know we can't all just suddenly sort things out with other people's things. So I do realise me not like Morocco because I thought they're culturally gross to women isn't necessarily right in a way, but it's just the way I felt about it. That's how you feel. And you, but Gabon I love. It's not like you go around saying, no one goes to Morocco. You just go, well, you know, I might just not go back. Yeah, and that's I, fine. Yeah, I'm good. That's, yeah. But um, Gabon was cool. Again, I stayed in the jungle there, but I liked Gabon. But it was, again, it was... It was interesting. I remember that I was on the malaria pills, and uh, my ex was like, "Have you eaten today?" Because she she mothered me a bit, uh, and I was like, "No." And she's like, "We'll just go to the shop." And so like, it's not it's it's not like that. Look, there isn't a shop. Yeah. We have to drive, and hopefully there's a dude with a wheelbarrow, and we can get something there. Like right. it was so it was so like diff- like the infrastructure was like so different as well. Mm. Like I remember we're in the back of this army jeep, and like the roads are mad, so it just hit our heads on the back. Me and Alicia were trying to play cards on the top of like a an ammo case and just everything's falling over. <laughs> but yeah, no, I need to do more of Africa. That's like big on my list. I so do I because I I, I travelled around Africa a bit, but I was really young, so I feel yeah. like I, I didn't. I was just being dragged around by my mum. Yeah, <laughs> you know, going yeah, from this yeah. place to that place. I was in Ethiopia. I was in Djibouti. So it wasn't. I feel like I'd love to do that as an adult. When, when do you count travelling as counting? What do you mean? As in I've actually travelled to them. Yeah, yeah. So there's places that I've been before I was, say, 16, but I yeah. don't count them now. I've I've rubbed up, I've got this app called Bean, and it like you can mark everywhere that you've gone, that you've so been. you can see okay. everything. Cool. And I won't. Um, I I feel like your experience of a place after a certain age is different. So that, it is different. I, I definitely think it's different. I don't know if I have a cut off age. I'd probably. Do you know what I think might impact the cut-off age as well for certain people will be how many places they've been to. So yeah. you've been to a lot of places for work and you've yeah. been to places to, to just visit as an adult, right? Mm. Um, so for you, it makes sense to not really count anything yeah. under 16, but somebody else might have only been to like two or three countries. They might be like, no, I went to like mm. wherever when I was 12. I'm counting it. Yeah, kind of thing. True. Um, so I guess it could be different for everyone. But for me, I think anywhere where I wasn't able to go anywhere by myself, yeah. I don't count. Yeah. I think that's fair. So I, it probably would be if I was to give it an age 16. Um, yeah. So all of my school trips to like France and Belgium, I don't really count them because mm. one, we used to go to all of the same places mm. and we were always in a group with teachers. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and then when I was really young traveling with my mum, I only really count. I just realized my answer was wrong to where I've lived abroad, the, long, the, wrong, the longest outside of England. Where was it? It was Djibouti. Outside of England, that's where I lived the longest. So I lived there from when I was two till I was five. Oh, shit. Yeah. So that's three years. It's a little tiny, I don't know if you know where it is. No. It's a tiny little French-speaking country in the centre center of Africa. Do you speak French? Oh, no, it's really bad now. Yeah. It was really good when I was a child. So when I was a kid, I spoke French, Swahili and English. Um, and Kikuyu, which is my mum's tribal language the mother tongue wow. um but then i also my nanny was from eritrea who yeah. looked after me in Djibouti, and so i also spoke amharic as well so like there's this little smart alec toddler because I, I know i was a pain in the ass yeah. that was just walking around super like all of these different languages totally multilingual five languages yeah as a as a toddler right Fuck me. and then i went back to kenya when i was um i was just turning six i did one year of school there and then i came here when i was seven yeah 
Um, and then by by the end of primary school, I didn't remember any. I only Swahili and, and English. So you speak that's Swahili. So I can speak Swahili now. So I can yeah. speak Swahili and English, and I can understand Kikuyu, but it's the pronunciation is too tough for me. But I still think from like memory, you would be able to pick it up. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, I, it's a different type of tough. intelligence. Like, I wish I had that, but that's... I, I can only tap into it every now and again. Like, with French, I have to tap back into it. So I, mm. I did French at school, and I did really well. Mm. But then as soon as I wasn't doing it every day, it just went. Mm. And then at university, I had to pick a... Because I wanted to do law, but I wanted mm. to have a year abroad. And the mm. only one that they did that with was European Legal Studies, um, which is the name of the course. So it's still a it's still a qualifying law degree, but you get to go to a European country for a That's year. Cool. So I was like, oh, I want to do that. But that meant that one of my modules had to be a language. Yeah. So I just picked French. Yeah. Um, but thankfully, I decided not to go to France because they didn't have any English taught classes. Mm. They do not teach in English and French. Uh, everyone can speak English, yeah. um, but they don't in France. Sorry, they don't teach. So I was like, I'm not going to be able to understand legal phrases in French. It's yeah. not that good yet. So I didn't go to France, <laughs> but. I found when I was, you know, I picked it back up again, but then I finished uni, it's gone again. Yeah. So, the only two consistent ones have been Swahili and English. That's still fucking impressive. That's, <laughs> so that's it. People. But, um, yeah, so I realised that that was the wrong answer for that one. All right, let's move on. So, finally, my last question. What travel tips would you give to listeners who are looking to broaden their horizons this year? Have you got any must-dos? Travel tips? Um... Uh, four travel tips. I don't. I, hmm. Interesting. I, I don't, I'm quite. I'm. I'm reasonably strange as a person. I, I always feel like I, I set myself goals when I go away. Like I want to write every day. I want to take photos every day. Mm. Stuff like that. But like largely, it's more being spontaneous and saying yes to everything. Um, like when I went to Vietnam, I wanted to. I, I wanted to surprise myself, and I wanted to feel like. I don't know. I get a real buzz out of doing stuff in life that I feel like I I can't do. Yeah. You know, like um, you know, for, for North Face, um, I had to climb a cliff face, and I've never climbed a cliff face in my life. Um, and they were like, right, we need someone to go up first, uh, so they can <laughs> film from the top. And I was like, yeah. All right, there's a whole story to this that's a bit mad. I'll tell, I'll tell, it's a good story. It's a good story. So um, <laughs> we we go to. North Face, my mate Ricky's directing. I, I just wanted to be on the shoot because I wanted North Face on my resume. So mm-hmm. I, um, I'm i shooting, Ricky's directing. Uh, we get there and we have to take a helicopter to the top of this cliff to find this North Face store that they've made. It's very bougie. Um, we jump out of the helicopter because the helicopter can't land and then we have to jump back on the helicopter to get out. Next day comes and we have to climb this mountain to the top. So it's like a 30k walk. I'm filming the whole way, so it's pretty much one-handed. I have to keep running ahead of the talent so I can film them. We get to the top and we're sweating. The producer, who's a little bit fruity, um, forgot water and forgot the food. Fab. But pro- he, was, he was a bad producer. We, we'll, we'll all admit. <laughs> Shout out, Gio. Um, and basically, we got to the bottom and they're like, okay, cool, now we've got the, the cliff climb. And we're all, like, fucked. Like, we're sweating. We get there and we find out there's another 5k hike just to get to the place so we get there and we're like grey sweating we get there and this massive cliff face and like we need someone to climb it and basically you know gynecology position at the top and shoot between the legs and I for some reason was like yeah I'll do it that sounds like a good idea I didn't realise I was scared of heights. Uh, I've I've always never had a problem with heights, but, but then you've never been in that position. I've that never music. climbed. Well, I've 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 done like climbing in a centre in a very small wall. You know, I've never I've, I've never climbed a cliff face, and it's very different. You know, there, there isn't those blue and red things that you just hold on to. <laughs> it's very much there's a rock, and like there's the trainer who is a North Face um, expert. She was five months pregnant, and I was like. Look, I've never climbed before. Give us help. And she was like, Yeah, sure, don't worry. She was French. She didn't sound like that. Uh, just, just you uh, of be course, there. Uh, no problem. There you go, exactly. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, and then she just climbs to the top. And I was like, what are, you, what are you doing? And she's like, Oh, the best thing about climbing is just learning it for yourself. And like, I start, and I, I've, I've been told since that really for climbing, the strength is in your legs. It's not about your hands. But if my hands were not on a rock or not gripping something tightly, I was so scared. Oh, um, my God. I ripped my hand. So, like, I've got a scar there. And my hand's just bleeding. I'm trying to climb. I've got a camera swinging around my neck. 
get out halfway and I look down and I'm just like, oh my fucking God. And people are like, go on, bags, go on, bags, go on, bags. And it's the only thing that like kept me going. I was like sweating. I think I was crying. I was bleeding. <laughs> oh my and God. I get to the top, top and I'm just shaking so much. And I say to the woman, she's like, come on, you know, you know. And I was like, I am so scared. I am so scared. I don't know how to get to the top. Just one more. Come on, one more. And I get to the top. It's like 40, 50 metres up, something fucking mental. And I'm scared because I don't know how to trust the rope. It was all this thing. And she's like, okay, I'm going to undo your rope. I was like, what do you mean? She said, well, I've got to let other people climb up. I'm going to lock you to the wall. It can hold an elephant. And I was like, well, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> then she, she goes to do it. And I was like, don't kill me. Like, please don't kill me. Oh I'm not going to die, am I? She said, no, it's safe. You, you're so safe. And she went, she went to undo it. And I was so scared, I bit her. I, I just, you bit her? I don't know what came over <laughs> It became very much a bite or flight situation, <laughs> and I didn't know what to do, so I just bit her. Like it was, the, it was the weird. I did not know one. I was scared of heights, and two that my reflex is to bite people, and I found out both of those things. And then, then I have to just stand on this wall while I'm locked on, filming with my legs, just shaking. I get cramp in my foot. It was a whole ordeal. Oh my god! The director's god. climbing up underneath me. I'm just dripping blood and sweat and tears onto him. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's not a travel tip. But generally, <laughs> generally, generally, I recommend, I recommend, you know, like the the fruit of life is really experiencing stuff that is outside of your comfort zone. You know, you don't go to fucking China and go to McDonald's. I mean, sure, once in a while, fine. But like, go there, try stuff that's not on the menu. Try, right. you know, try, try a different thing on the menu. Even like in England, if I go to a restaurant, I want to try a different thing on the menu each time. So I'm a firm believer that I don't know what my favourite food is yet because I haven't tried it. Right. <clears throat> Same goes with like activities and like culture. Like, how do you know what you love doing unless you've done you it? You haven't tried it. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying go to a weird. I don't know. I'm not saying get involved in yakuza stuff or <laughs> anything mental. <clears throat> but well, how do you know? You might like it. <laughs> you might like it. That's what. That's why I won't try it. That's why I won't try it <laughs> because that's the danger. But you know, it's important, man. Like. There's, there's two t- types of knowledge in the world, a priori and a posteriori. And a priori knowledge will look at the uh, TV and see Egypt and go, I don't know about the pyramids. They've been there for thousands of years, dusty, sand, bit <laughs> yellow, you know, I know it. And there's a posteriori knowledge, which means, you know, I know how it smells, I know how it tastes, I know how it feels, and I've been there. And that kind of knowledge will open your mind to so much things, you know, like... Um, you know, even even like I, I recommend for people to go places where, especially being British and white, or even just only being from London, go to places where you are the minority. Go to places where you can experience what life is like for other people. Mm. I think it's extremely important, not just to like you know book glam holidays which are set by the pool, but book places where you actually go and see what other people live their life like. I feel yeah. like a lot of people, especially in England, you know, judge people and all this fear-mongering stuff that goes on in politics and they all believe they know about Syrians or whatever else, but actually going to those cultures and seeing how they live and seeing what they do, I think is very, very important. So my travel tips is, you know, don't don't be close-minded. Look somewhere that you might not have booked anyway. Try and, like me and my mum are doing a thing like, like me and my mum are like doing this thing now um, where every birthday my birthday I want to take her away and me and her go somewhere that both of us haven't been so we're trying to like knock off little little European weekends where we do that nice. and then on the outside now luckily I've got really good mates like fucking Freddie and Laura Jarvie where we are looking at different places where we can go each mm. year and we're looking at maybe doing Japan Machu Picchu just things that we've never done before just because shit's exciting man you to experience it experience it man yeah. go Try some, try some, but don't go too mental on the food. Um, I, I ate a snake's heart in Vietnam and that was a bit too far. Lord. It was too far. It was too far. <laughs> I've had snake, but not snake's heart. That sounds... It was crazy. Wow. It was crazy. But I went to this snake village. The guy who uh, was doing it, because the, they did experiences from the hostel. The guy that gave us was a fucking nutcase. He was proper like, <laughs> hey! You know, just one of those <laughs> awful, awful, awful dudes who just like... You know, you're like, how are you? He's like, yeah, tips, mate. He's just that guy, you know, <laughs> that guy. And he was our rep, and he takes us to this restaurant. And there was a tradition at the restaurant where they bring out a fucking snake. They just cut it open. There's blood, and it just push its God. heart out. Oh, and like, someone has to eat it. My God. And everyone's like, no, no, no. And they're like, oh, and he's like, oh, it's a bit offensive if no one does it. 
So I was like, all right, I'll, I'll do it. And I had to, I, I, I ate a snake's heart from it. Just not even fried or anything straight Felt from the, the oh <laughs> it's too much it oh my much. god <laughs> it, was too, it was potentially all right we started this podcast with my mouth watering i may throw up by the end <laughs> like, oh my uh, god so don't go that far don't do that but uh, honestly just experience some shit man like you you know like, you'll really you learn i feel like you learn a lot about yourself and what you want from life in the quiet still moments that you're experiencing at other people's and you know, I, I have, sounds probably very fucking uh, pretentious, but I do have like massive moments of euphoria when I travel. Um, I didn't even include Mexico. Mexico was fucking incredible. Um, that might be one of my favorite places. But you, like, I feel like when, when I go away, like that trip to Vietnam when I went on my own, by the end of it, I felt so extremely humbled by mm. myself and my life. And like, I think being stuck in the rat race of that working, you can really, um, really bog yourself down and really get stressed out and taking that moment a step back and not really be able to use your phone because you're in a foreign country you know, yeah. when you're on Wi-Fi mm-hmm. um, and just be with random strangers it's really surprising that how easy it is A, to make friends and B, what, like, what experiences you can have mm-hmm. when you're not on your phone and I'm the biggest victim of it fucking social media whore over here I'm on my phone all the oh, time same. but when I'm away I just feel so blessed. I'm just like, all I used for is to take photos. And I like to use my camera to take photos. I've got a professional camera. He's my iPhone to take most of my photos. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, yeah. And write. Keep travel journals. Do all that stuff. Amazing. That's a good answer. That was a great answer. That was a great answer. <sighs> I do go off of it, though, don't I? Just no, but very... that's a good thing. That's conversation. I yeah. think people worry about tangents a lot more now because we're so, like... It just everything everything is very condensed everything is very get straight to the point because yeah. you have this many characters to do it in or mm. whatever I'm just very yeah. tangential I think like but whenever those are the best conversations yeah thank you um, no but this uh, this has been really easy to talk to you actually I've really Good. enjoyed it I've really enjoyed it alright well we're getting into our final segment here Ooh. and this is called Mahakama now that is Swahili for yeah. court actually Swahili for high court but you're taking me to court no so <laughs> this I didn't segment, know about this man <laughs> this segment there's no, I promise you there are no legal repercussions for you Isn't or it? anyone where were you on July 6th <laughs> fuck's sake Linda I'm just going to pull out this CCTV footage no. <laughs> I brought the file <laughs> <laughs> um, no this segment is basically where I pick something um, a person a thing something that was in the story a news headline or something I found online or whatever and it basically gives me the opportunity to judge it uh, because I'm trying to be less judgmental in my life and I figured if I have one place where I can mm. hyper focus it once every two weeks it's I'll be it. less judgmental in my real life okay okay so far I think it's working it might be too soon to tell what have you judged so far quite a few things okay yeah there's been a there's been a few is it current affairs or is it sometimes like last week uh, or last episode with Tony for the Christmas episode we talked about Lizzo um, I don't know if you remember, but when she went, she went to that Lakers game in a t-shirt dress that had a hole cut out on the butt, and she was wearing a thong, and so it was just her bare ass cheeks out That's at mad. this Lakers game. Yeah, so we talked about that, um, and basically we judge it. So we say, obviously, there's no repercussions, but we say whether, whether we'd give the person or thing mercy or no mercy. Right. Yeah, that's okay. basically the aim of the segment. Now, since we had a travel episode, okay. I thought that we could go over maybe some plane travel behaviours oh my Lord. and see which are acceptable or not to you. Straight away, okay. before you even started, if, if bare feet are there, that's no mercy. <laughs> bare feet is there. So no. I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you some scenarios and oh I'm gonna ask whether Lord. you'd give the traveller in question mercy or no mercy. So okay. bare feet, we're in there straight away, absolutely no mercy, and I agree because disgusting. It's disgusting. And even if you want to take your shoes off, socks. Yeah, yeah. What's wrong with socks? Even the person who has the most beautiful feet in the world, their butters. I hate feet. Like, feet I, are I, disgusting. When I was on the flight to China, some, this, the Chinese lady who was next to me, she put, she put a bare foot on my knee. No, I, no. Absolute. On your knee? On my knee. <laughs> oh, my God. I was so I'm bad. so angry I for you. Like, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> she didn't care. I couldn't talk to her. I was just like, oh, yeah. Fucking hell. Absolutely the fuck not. That well, would have been a fight. Also, this isn't travel, but I, I got the day I got back from Vietnam, I went to um, went, went to pick up some food on a shoot, went to Greg because it's the only thing that was closed. A woman was cutting her toenails in, in, in the oh sit-down Oh, my of Greg's. God. Oh, my God. No bare feet in restaurants. No bare feet on public transport. 
No mercy. No no mercy. Honestly, no bare feet anywhere outside of your own home, no. to be honest, or a swimming pool. Like, I'd, other than that, I, it's just disgusting. I don't, want, I don't have weird feet, but I don't want anyone to look at them. Same. They're just my feet. They're quite, they're, no feet look good. They're weird. Same, I agree. But even if Imagine we were feet people... You just little fingers <laughs> they just, like, stuffy little <laughs> fingers. Imagine and that. then they stepped on the ground like, ill. No, I hate feet. Oh. All right, let's move on oh. before, again, throwing up. So, um, not having a passport or boarding pass to hand at security. Mercy or no mercy for this traveller. So, you know the ones that they get to security and they're just, like, quickly going through their bags because they didn't have it in their hand. Does that bug you? Uh, I mean... It's stupid. You should have it out. Mm-hmm. But it's not the end of the world. It's, it's like when people go to the shop and they don't have money out or whatever. Yeah. I mean, it depends how long they're going to take. I, I don't think it's that much of a serious offence. I've never experienced it in a bad way. Okay. And generally, if I'm on my way to get on a flight, I'm not like, oh, I'm in a rush. Like... Right, you're giving yourself time. You're I'm not chilling, like, man. Yeah. As soon as I got to the airport, I am so... You know, there's no reason to get stressed. On the way back through... It's a different story. Right. It's a different story. It's a bit more stressful when you're getting home. But when you go on holiday, chill, man. So mercy for you for that Mercy. Well, for saying? me, um, I, I do the same thing as you in the sense of I give myself as much time as possible so that I'm not stressed and I'm not like, oh, I need to get there. But I'm going to give this person no mercy unless they're traveling with children because that still irritates the shit out of me. Yeah. And I don't know why. I just, I'm like... You know where we're going. There's like yeah. nothing else that you needed to have in your hand right at this moment. I agree. You and your your boarding part. Like, why did you put it away? Yeah. Like, it's the only thing you'll need. Yeah. You don't even need your money at this point because there's no more shops. There's no more any like. I have never experienced it that much. I, I think maybe because it's personal to me. Maybe that's why I'm so stressed by it because I keep it keeps happening to me. Do you, it happens to me what, all the time. What happens to your demeanor in a situation? Um. No, my outside. Yeah. I'm okay. But do you like that? No, 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 I don't make a sound. I don't want to make the person feel bad. Mm. But in my head, I'm kind of calling you some names. Okay. Because I'm just like, dude, you had one job. I think I do kiss my teeth for people in that situation. Do you? Yeah, but I'm quite passive aggressive. Oh, that's why. That'll do it. <laughs> yeah. All right, what about, so you're on the plane now. Yeah, yeah. Tra- the traveller in front of you reclines their seat. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. The thing is, right, I think... I wish you guys could see his mannerisms right now. He's so angry. <laughs> I, I think there should be an unwritten rule amongst everyone that don't don't put your seat back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, every, no one enjoys it. It's fucking like I'm look. <laughs> I'm six foot three. I don't fit anywhere. Everyone talks about how how hard it is being short. Being tall's fucked, right? Yeah. You don't fit anywhere. Nope. I sit mainly, you won't see this on the podcast, but it's largely, I have to like put both to my knees side. together and like go one way and yep. like lean. As soon as that table comes back, my legs get crushed every time. I just, every single time. And you just like, why the fuck? This is not benefiting you that much. Mm-hmm. I think get rid of the recliner button. No one needs it. Yep. It's not, it doesn't Also, how them. much more comfortable... Can you be? So what, you sit, I, I'm really bad at angles, so tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah. But like you're sitting, I'm assuming, at kind of close to 45 yeah. degrees. 90. So being able, is that 90? See, yeah. I'm terrible 45 at 45 is that? Oh yeah, no, you don't, you're not sitting at 45. So you're sitting at 90. Yeah. I mean, the most you're going to get to is maybe 100. Yeah. It's not like you're going, it's not like you're going to be in one of those first class and pods where you can sleep. Like it's you're kind just of like going a little anyway. bit. There's no point I'm sitting on the, like sitting on the chair where I wish I could go slightly back a little bit. It's awful. It, there's no point to it. I, I'm with you on that one. No mercy. No mercy. And again, I'd probably I'd, I'd say something. I'd say, do you mind, man? Come on, man. I've got to be honest. I've had to say something. I've, yeah. I've had to say something because, like, I mean, I'm not I'm not six three. I'm five ten, but, but I've still, got tall. really long legs. Yeah. So already I'm at this angle that you described. Yeah. Your, your knees are kind of together and to one side because yeah. you can't you can't just be like this, like yeah. straight. And then the next thing you know, your little table thing is on your lap. Your TV is like right here, and you're just like, okay, I when, can't. When you do it with food this. as well, the food's come out, or you got a drink. The chair nearly hits the glass. Yes, like uh, it, yeah. The, the table stays in the same position, mm. and then you got to fucking pull the TV thing out. I have no. I think anyone who will recline their chair on a plane has the heart of a serpent, and they're. <laughs> 
But they know. A heart what of a serpent that you'll eat. I'll, if I'll, you I'll have eat, to. I'll, I'll fucking eat that. <laughs> you heart. fucking eat it. I'll fucking eat that. Heart. <laughs> Dis- disgusting, Carrie. I'm lowest of the low. Scum. I'm not- Honestly, I think unless like you're on a super late flight and there's nobody nobody behind you. Fine. Go for your life. But you're on a packed flight. There are no, people behind you. Why the not. fuck are you reclining for this extra nine to ten degrees? Absolutely Bore off with it. Yeah, no mercy. Absolutely I'm not. with you on that one. All right. What about... So you're now mid-flight. Okay, cool. Wi-Fi's kicked in. Hello. Long Skype or FaceTime calls no. mid-flight. No. So someone's there with their laptop having a good old chin wag. No. Why? <laughs> no. Maybe they're bored. It's part of their entertainment. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> but at the same time, go walk to the end of the plane or something... Go walk in that little bit, by, hang out by the toilets, right at the back. Do your thing. Don't do it there. Is it like, I would never dream of doing that. I And I think the person who does that, you can't be that not self-aware to realise what a punk you're being in that mm-hmm. situation. Like, what is even the conversation? I, I beg to differ. There are plenty of people that are not self-aware at all. Dickens. At all. Dickens. Like, they will do the worst shit and just not realise that don't, it's horrible. Don't you think, though, going on a plane, I, I love the fact that when I go on a plane, I'm switched off. Yeah. I, fi- I, I find it so liberating that I'm just like, cool. Yeah. I mean, normally I'm with Kruger or with someone that I'm chatting to anyway, or even when I'm on my own. Mm. I really, really enjoy the break from social media. I don't see the need to tailor over. What are you going to talk about? Like, oh, yeah, no, I'm on the fly. That's and, crazy. like, there's still oh, wow. clouds and stuff. No. Do you know what I do? The only time I actually get my phone out um, will be right at the start, just before you take off. Yeah. And, I'm, I'm, you know, I'll put it on Instagram stories or whatever. True, true. Um, and then, you know, when I'm just landing, I'll take some pictures, because obviously yeah. still not connected to, to the internet usually. Yeah. Um, I'll take some pictures because it's beautiful, especially if you land at night and you can see all the lights. Yeah, it's stunning. It. I'll take the pictures of it because I'll post them later. That's but fine. that's all I need it for. Yeah. Like, and I'm addicted to my phone. Yeah. And if I can do it, I think... I think you're right on that one. No mercy. And also, like, I remember when I was going to Toronto on my own um, to work on an event, I was sat next to this guy and he was, like, telling me this thing. He's like, you know, it's crazy these days that, you know, you everyone expects such instant replies and instant to everything. The fact that, like, my wife hasn't been able to get a hold of me this entire time, she'll be annoyed or she'll be worried um, because I didn't manage to text her before we set off. But back in the day, if I was going on a trip, you'd have to call the hotel, motel or hotel, mm-hmm. they'd slip a letter under my door, and then you'd have to call them back. Yeah. But now, like, if it's not an instant reply, I think it, it's... There's it, a panic. If you're travelling, use it, the reason to step away from your phone. I agree. It's not needed. Right. Travellers with babies and young children. Crying babies and young children. Okay, so they got they got they got the first class. They got the business class. Mm-hmm. They got the premium economy. They got the economy. Mm-hmm. I'm saying let's make a baby class. I'm okay. saying let, let's separate a little bit more. Okay. I'm not saying uh, you know <laughs> it is mad uh-huh. when you've got a baby the entire time. And I understand you know air pressure, being a child in the plane is probably a lot. Mm-hmm. But I don't want it to. <laughs> don't want to impact your journey. I don't want it to impact my journey. You know, <laughs> hey. It's really annoying. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there are some airplanes where you can see where babies are sat. Oh, yeah, when you go, like, when you do early check-ins. And I was, yeah. I, I, I went on a date with this girl who was an air steward, and she said when people are rude to them at check-in, mm. they they will sit look where them. a baby is and they'll sit them next to the baby. I love just that. To fuck with them. I love How that pity energy. That? That's amazing. Sick. So, like, all these people, all these, like, fucking entitled wankers or mm-hmm. going for stage, like, no, fucking, no, I want to get on the fucking flight now or whatever dickhead thing they're going to say. <laughs> oh, fucking... It's polo. accent, by the way. Yeah. Uh, you, it's, the, it's that person. Yeah, you, yeah, it's perfect. People don't know about my accent. <laughs> but, uh, it, like, they purposely will sit there next to a baby. So, again, meet people with good energy. Yes. Meet people with good energy. You never know. And don't sit near babies. Because at the end of the day, it'll be your headache that yeah. you'll have to answer for. See, I, I struggle with this one because I don't want to say no mercy because, you know, you have to get places. And if you've got kids, you've got kids. Um, I do like the idea of a baby class. That would be cool. Mm. Because you could, like, you could dress it up to be baby friendly. Like, it could be super sensory and calming for the baby so that they have, you know, a relaxed yeah. trip, right? Um, I beg we go on Dragon's Den. Yeah. This is an idea. Let's do it. I'll cut this bit out. We'll yeah, go yeah, on Dragon's yeah, yeah. Den. This is the thing. Why is that not a thing? You could make it a sensory experience. You could make it so much more chill in that area. Yeah. This is the thing. All right. Right. We're going to do it. Okay. So, 
chatty travellers. So as in strangers, not people you know. So you're sat next to somebody who wants to have a full-on conversation for your whole seven-hour trip. Love it. Really? Love it. Okay. Love it. And I think, yeah, no, I, I'd really like that. It depends. It depends. But I, I, I don't know, I really... Maybe it's the documentarian in me, but I really like talking to strangers. Okay. Like, I love it. Like, um, I, you know, I go and sit and talk with strangers all the time. I sit and talk to a lot of homeless people all the time. I really like finding out about people's stories. Mm -hmm. Um, Me and Tony D had this really weird conversation. Uh, One of the first times I met him, we're standing on this overpass on the M25 uh, at a Burger King or something, and we're driving to an event in Leeds, and I was driving us all up there. And we're standing on this overpass, and I was like, do you know it's mad? when you realise that all of these cars that are going past us, everyone has got like their own narrative, point of view, like everything. You, you, I forgot what you called it, like it's a theory, but it's the point of realisation of that is got a name to it, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But like, I, I'm like that, so whenever I get the opportunity to talk to people, I'm really fascinated by... Their viewpoint. Yeah, so I love yeah. it. Like, I hate it when I get, like, sometimes like when I go to sit on the plane, like, I'm not the person who will start the chat on the plane, but... Um, like, I'm excited to see who sits next to me, and I'll be let down if I'm not, oh, this guy looks a bit dead, man. <laughs> I don't want to have a chat with him. But, like, if someone wants that, like, some of the most interesting conversations I've had are on planes. Again, it's the same as what Fight Club uh, say about single serving use people. Yeah. That you can meet someone, you can have a really intimate and in depth conversation mm-hmm. with them about everything or anything or whatever you want that conversation to be. And then. That's it. They're gone. Yeah. And I've had some really fascinating conversations with strangers that I'll never talk to or meet again, and I like it. So entire mercy. In fact, if they're a douchebag, if it was like some guy who was just like going on about themselves and where all the places they like to go. Yeah. yeah. You went to the boys as well. I know. You want to go? (laughs) You want to go? It's come naturally when you talk about these people. You went to the (laughs) Cotswolds. I think I'll probably say mercy as well for similar reasons. Although I prefer a friendly traveller over a extra chatty traveller to find extra chatty so for me I don't in my head a friendly traveller is somebody who says you know hi and whatever and you kind of maybe have a quick little chat here and there and whenever the food comes you kind of look out for each other if one's asleep you go food's here you know Mm. stuff like that I like that overly chatty is somebody who is like oh and then I went here and then I went there and then I did this and then I did that and it's just like oh there's so much information all I want to do is watch like whatever shitty film is on the entertainment right now and I just need a break or if it's like a night flight as well you're tired yeah yeah. fair so I think if it's the case where you try to put the headphones in and they're yeah and they've still got another story and that's like but generally I I, I like those little chats alright next one travellers that grab the seat in front to get up so you know the little headdress thing where people grab so say you're, you're just sitting there minding your business and then somebody uses your headdress to get up mercy or no mercy do you want to think of I've ever done that? <laughs> this is what I did. I was like, oh, no mercy. And then I went, hang on, I think I might have done that to somebody by accident. Yeah, no. I, I, like, the thing is, I, I... And then had to immediately apologise. I'd, I'd hate it. Yeah. But I think I might have done it. Yep, I'm with you on that one. I'm big, man. I know. There's not a lot of stuff to hold. And what? when you're sat in that position we were talking about earlier when you're talking... Yeah. It's, you kind of have to manoeuvre your way up and yeah. you need some assistance and sometimes. And if the seats come back. Oh, if the seat comes back, then fuck them, I don't care. Yeah, true. I don't give a shit. I, oh, man. I'll probably grab a bit if you top your head. True. To get up, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> That's your own fault. Why are you on my level? <laughs> uh, I'd say no mercy because it would annoy me. I'd get really yep. pissed off about it. But at the same time, I, I might have done it. Yeah, so. I'm with you on that one. And the final one. Somebody wearing a lot of perfume or cologne. It depends. Okay. Depends if it was a peg smell or not. Right. Because, you know, if it was like Grandma Lavender, <laughs> uh, it'd probably be too much. Yeah. But generally, like, I don't know, man. I don't mind a bit of a scent on the plane. It's very, like, planes weirdly don't smell of anything, even though no. it's there because they're doing loads of stuff. That weird recycled air smell is what I call it. If you wear a jeep, no. Get, <laughs> get out. Jeep. Remember jeep? Yeah. Bring back jupe. Like, oh my uh, god. Jupe. Can you imagine the whole flight just smelling jupe? It's what every teen yes. is, uh, like fucking nightclub smells like mm. jupe. Or um, Versace red jeans. Yes. I remember when I used to I wear jupe. I had Versace red jeans. jeans. It's fucking hot, awful. <laughs> Terrible. Even at the moment, I've got diesel only to brave, and I'm pretty sure that's a teen nightclub smell. But it was, on, it was fucking tenor. Uh, and, you know, I'm frugal. Uh, yeah. It, 
It depends it's, on the smell for you. It depends on the smell. It's a difficult one. Okay. Because there are certain smells that absolutely I would be annoyed about. Yeah. Um, but if they were a Dior Sauvage, hello, wouldn't mind that smell. <laughs> I'm one of those guys, though, even if I don't... I might have just used my aftershave. Yeah. At any time I go through duty-free... Mm-hmm. Got and, a little something. And, and do you know do you know what the funny thing is about do, getting a freebie yeah is you, it's a normal thing to do but you always feel naughty yeah you know you're always going through you feel a bit cheeky you find, you find the tester yeah you make sure no one's looking at you at the same time <laughs> you, you do a little spray and then if someone comes I always do this I'm 31 I'm nearly 32 I'm nearly 32 years old and every like like a child every every single time if I'll, I'll spray myself if someone comes up and uh, goes Oh, can I help you, sir? I'll just, I'll pick a box up and go. Oh, oh, sixty pounds. That's I've seen it cheaper than that. And I put, I put that one all way. But every time, because I, I feel like for some reason I'll create this narrative that I was definitely going to buy it. You were, but you've but changed like, your mind at this moment. It's because I've suddenly been caught and yeah. I feel naughty. And so for some reason, as a fully grown adult, I don't know why. Every single time I make some, I, I do some pantomime performance of oh. <laughs> I, I, I'll be back in a minute. Do you know that like, even when I, I, did, I did it today? I did it today. And when I go to the Port Road Market, do you know you can, um, when you go to like street food places, there'll always be someone with a fork or a fucking toothpick or something with you a bit try of food something, on it. yeah. And you'll just be like, oh, oh yeah. Oh, I'll, be, I'll be back in a I'm minute. Back. As you go around every single one, getting your free lunch <laughs> from a collection of people. And you never intend to go back. You're just like, oh, oh, oh lovely. Oh, I'll, be, I'll be back in a minute. Do you think they expect the performance at this point? Do you think it'd be rude not to? I would like to to stop this behaviour with myself. <laughs> I just see... Because I think it's normal. Everyone's doing it. But for some reason, in my head, I feel some strange, strange reason to just create this lie. Yeah. And I do it. I, I do and you it. do it convincingly. I, I don't think it is convincing. Oh. I think I don't believe myself. I think that's part of the problem. I think they're just like, what? It's all right if you just wanted to spray. That's, yeah. That's why it's a testable. Yeah. But for some reason, I have to, I have to lie because mm. I'm embarrassed and I don't want to be found out. So yeah, no, that's my adult life. Um, nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but um. So yeah, perfume client. You're gonna say mercy. Mercy. It depends what you're wearing. Duke I it. think. Um, I think yeah you're right it depends on whatever I personally I love a good perfume uh, but that is the one time I don't wear perfume when I'm getting on a flight so I have my normal deodorant um, but I won't I won't add any kind of perfume or perfume oils or anything even just because I yeah I won't that's how I get my cash back I know no I don't I actually really don't um, I, th- I bought perfumes at duty free but I've never like sprayed any on myself ever just because I'm very aware, like, I just know that every smell isn't for everyone. So I would I, hate I, to be the person that's, like, super irritating somebody. Or if someone's got, like, allergies, you know, people can get like, really affected. Yeah. And I just think, oh, if it was me, I would hate it. So I just don't. I fully respect the levels of care for other people <laughs> that you've got in that situation. I feel like a kid in a sweet shop. Every time I go for duty free, <laughs> getting that free spray makes me so happy. I was... I'm, Booking the flight's half of the joy. <laughs> Knowing I'm going for duty free and I that's, get some that's free examples. The kicker. And when you go in, it's like, oh, they've they got a free whiskey, do they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, lo- oh, I love a deal. I, lo- I love having the opportunity to get something for free. Oh, and maybe it's just me. Maybe I'll. Some, listen, people like free stuff. And it's the North Yorkshire. Wrong with that. It's there's the North nothing Yorkshire. wrong with it at all. <laughs> well, listen, thank you so, so much for doing this. No, it's this been, has been an pleasure. amazing episode. I'm so glad. Hey, you were it's able been to do this. lovely to get the opportunity to just chat with you. Yeah, um, yeah. Hey. It'd be outside an event and just talk life. Yes, um, agreed. And even if it's not on a podcast, I'd love to talk to you more. Oh, same. Hey. hey. Oh, if you want me to bring more, I love doing this. This is. Ah, uh, no, I think one's enough. No joking. Oh, <laughs> oh <laughs> shit. Fuck. Oh. Oh, what time is it? <laughs> like, oh. Well, I've got to go now. Could you, so. could you, could you leave? <laughs> could you leave? Could you... Yeah, I'm actually in his house, so I have to kind of, yeah, I kind of go yeah. now. But um, <laughs> um, no, but seriously, thank you so much for doing this. It's been a pleasure. Thank you um, so much. And you can follow Liam on socials. Is is it all at Body Body Bagnall? Body Body Bagnall. Yeah, uh, it's at, so it's actually a, everyone always thought it was Body Bagnall. So really, it's Body Bagnall. Body Bagnall. Body Bagnall. Yeah. Now, um, yeah, at Body Bagnall and everything. Um, or if you want to see some of my work that's not uh, Battle Rap related and stuff that I care about, there is vimeo.com slash Liam Bagnall Films, and it's got a bunch of stuff in it, so have a look. I'll put that in the description. Everyone should check that out for sure. Thank you. Right, well, guys, thank you so much for tuning in, and I will catch you in a couple of weeks.
Bye!